I don't want this game to fail, and honestly, I don't think it will, at least financially. There's a lot of love going into this remake from devs and fans alike. What I'm about to talk about comes from that place of love for the original Silent Hill 2 and the series as a whole, and not from some craven desire to tear down the efforts of the clearly talented crews of people who put this remake together. But neither am I here to artificially inflate the value of every single change. I'm currently juggling the production of a few other videos like the part 2 of the PC install guide covering the second wave of Silent Hill titles and the Silent Hill 1 deep dive analysis video, but I wanted to get some commentary out quick while the iron was yet hot. I don't usually traipse around the internet absorbing opinions. I'm generally too busy or too sick for that, and I don't trust what my sense of the general consensus is. But I have heard some things, and one thing in particular is that apparently if you do not agree with this direction, you must have never been a true fan in the first place, never have played the originals. It's this kind of talk that makes me angry. Who are you? Who are any of us to declare who is or is not a fan? If I'm upset, it's because I love this game. I'm used to being in the minority of opinion, but it never gets easier to live there. These are my own feelings and opinions, and I hope some of you share some of them, so at the very least, I don't feel alone in the excitement and slow-burning despair of years of being told some of my favorite stories will yet live again when they truly died a long time ago. The first thing I notice is this is not Silent Hill 2. It looks like Silent Hill 2, but really it's Resident Evil 2, with James instead of Leon and Silent Hill instead of Raccoon City. Now that we have more than the combat trailer, I think it's safe to say we already knew this going in. But it seems more and more clear that this is the goal when Monica Hamura says that they need to match industry standards for horror titles. We want players to feel satisfaction while playing. Uh, remembering that uh, we need to fit in horror genre standards. I'm not a Resident Evil fan. I'm a Silent Hill fan. These are very different games with different needs and different foci. I love Silent Hill for being itself, not for being Resident Evil. Classic Silent Hill 2 has more in common with the contemporary walking sim or the mist likes of yesteryear than an action-adventure horror game. Often cited as a universally acclaimed remake is the original Resident Evil remake from 2002. That's a faithful remake with polished graphics, voice work, controls, and additional content, while still maintaining exactly what the original was all about. What we have here with Silent Hill 2 is a reimagining, and that's okay. But telling me to expect faithfulness and seeing dramatic deviations from the original sets the wrong expectations. So you think this is a dream, huh? Well, if it's not a dream, what is it? The promotional material really wants to push how faithful the remake of Silent Hill 2 is, when really I think they should be committing to how different it'll be. Faithfulness is maintaining the camera angles, the script, the sound design, and even the weaker aspects like combat, and improving them. That's the point of a remake, or at least should be. Different does not mean better, it just means different. I'm open to different, and I'm open to different being an improvement. So am I convinced that there is an improvement? No. And yes, Silent Hill has always succeeded better when focusing on terror rather than horror. The difference being terror is the anticipation and tension of some moment to come, while horror is the feeling of revilement during or after that same event. Horror is seeing how awful a city filled with infected people eating each other alive is. Terror is the feeling that I have to jump down a pitch dark hole not knowing what's at the bottom. Horror is about what you see, terror is about what you don't see. One suits a refined combat system, and the other doesn't, in general. The fight against monsters is prepared in a more tactical form, and it's mainly based on the varied designs of the enemies. I'm wary of this term tactical, which usually refers to tactics in a military scenario. Does this mean Silent Hill 2 is going to be more action-based game than a horror, or rather terror, game? Yes. Combat looks much more brutal and fast-paced. James doesn't act desperately, but confidently. The monsters are much more aggressive and can grab James and even his weapons. I'm glad they seem to have removed the QTE prompts that were always a worry and a prevalent criticism of Homecoming years ago. Finishers come back and now involve the weapon in hand, which continues the trend from Origins, but it's nice to see they maintain the stomp too. The concern I have right now is how many hits it takes to fully down a monster. In the original, one stomp would finish it off. 
a definite finale to the combat, or a way to ensure it wouldn't get up, allowing you to focus on the next monster. Having to beat it several times seems like it'll feel tedious, or at least more brutal than necessary. This was done in Silent Hill 3, but more for a narrative purpose to emphasize that Heather is a 17-year-old girl and not a 30-something-year-old man. It still sucked to play, but when Silent Hill is good, combat always gives way to story. James isn't an action hero, and that's very true, and a defining part of his character, at least gameplay-wise. Yet he ducks and dodges like one, not scrambling or stumbling. He can break open car windows with a single tap, which, while I like the idea mechanically, feels like it should take more doing than that or require a better tool, like shooting it open, sacrificing a bullet for what's inside, to lean into the survival angle if that's what we're going for now. Not having health regen is great, it's just the red edges start to become distracting and take away from the color palette and mood of a given scene when low on health. A solution would make the edges black, or just eliminate it altogether, as the limping animation depicts low health readily enough. Perhaps the red can stay for active combat, or when taking damage, and go away when the threat is passed. I like seeing the nutritional supplement, aka the health drink, making a comeback here, but I'm not sure how I feel about the syringes. I'm certain it changes from the first aid kits to accommodate the real-time healing animation, but feels much more, again, brutal and unsafe than drinking from a sealed bottle or applying bandages from a first aid kit. Which I guess leans into James's character if he's going for the in-water ending, but not so much for the other endings. So I get why it's here. It's just weird to see in real time James jabbing himself with drugs. It's less bad when it's done in a menu, because there's some level of abstraction where your mind can divorce the real world application of medicines and the restoration of video game health via imagination or just outright ignoring the absurdity. But hey, we do have 180 turns back in. Really glad to see that. The instant weapon swap from gun to pipe is handy, though I can't tell if this is a reaction command or a hotkey. It works for this type of combat, and it's something I actually might have liked to see in the original. I do wonder if there's some sort of homecoming style upgrade, where if James finds the pipe that historically functioned nearly identically to the wooden plank, if he discards the wooden plank entirely in favor of the pipe. It's one of the few things I think homecoming did right, and would be a good change for Silent Hill 2. Perhaps other weapons would upgrade the same way to incentivize exploration in the newly expanded town. The original Silent Hill 2 is known for having awful combat, yes. Does developing and refining the combat make the game a better experience? I'd actually argue no. The answer lies in what Shattered Memories and PT already did with better success than their other second wave contemporaries. Cut the combat altogether. The hardest was designing combat. I'll bet it was. Don't get so mad. I was just joking. If you fundamentally change the camera work, you'll either need to invent something totally new or just lift from Resident Evil's remakes wholesale. The camera is very important to the mood and feel of the game. The original fixed cameras were positioned to make an area feel big, or to box James in, or to hide enemies off screen. Now monsters are down hallways, and even literally spotlit. Remember, terror is about what you can't see. Anticipation. Tension. The radio emphasizes this concept to alert the players to nearby monsters you can't see fueling the fear in the mind more than functioning as sonar. The knowing and imagining is more frightening than confronting the monster directly. Also, it's nice to hear that old radio static, but with some nice additional popping added in. It's good stuff. Areas are bigger now, and less claustrophobic to accommodate a lower camera angle that's freely manipulated. Compare this shot to this shot of what I believe to be the same scene, or how the padded cell is pretty flat and boring not even worth entry in the trailer, rather than being uncomfortably tight and memorable thanks to the benefit of the high camera. I'm curious how the hallway chase scene is going to work if you can't see behind you. It could be a good thing not to be able to see the red pyramid thing as he's chasing you, but at the same time, you'll only ever know if he's there if he's dealing damage, or I guess if he's really loud. But not having eyes on Maria also hurts this scene. I imagine the scene will be overhauled with lots of loud yelling, but we'll see. So when making a game with static cameras, you as a designer have much more control over what players see, where they go and so on. The change for the third person perspective was a challenge. Look, I'm just a dumb player. I don't know where you want me to look when a scare pops up. I want you to have control over my camera, either directly or by manipulating the environment, which becomes harder and harder to do the more control I, as a player, have over it. And I'm guessing that's why there's an excess of horror stings to make sure I look at the scary thing. Ah! 
The cutscenes are... I don't know. They're not better. The radio scene with the first encounter with the lying figure has it clearly staged behind James, with James himself awkwardly to the right of the screen to make room for it. In the original, the monster is obscured and only heard as the camera unfocuses on James and swings to the left to focus on the new threat. It's a slow and uncertain camera, contrasting the fast and bumbling new scene. James prying the wooden plank also feels like it has little more resistance than tearing off wallpaper. By contrast, the original has James back up and bump into the boards behind him with the camera reacting with him. This is also accompanied by controller vibrations, which may or may not be the case in the new game. Later scenes overemphasize details like the hospital examination room, which was a normal unassuming door in the original, but now is a towering door of bloody doom in the remake. Subtle. We can clearly see Laura closing the door behind James instead of a sudden slam behind him. Laura! Terror is what you don't see, and for a split second, it's uncertain who shut the door, even if obvious a moment later. Not so in the remake. Even these cutaways to the Flesh Lips monster is very hard to see. Now I agree obscuring details is great, do that, but it's a bit too dark for me to quite tell that it's something to be disturbed by and much too fast before cutting away. What are you doing? Ha ha, I tricked you. Open the door, Laura. Why should I? I'm a liar, right? Want me to open it? Huh? Huh? Do ya? New technologies gives us a chance to do things that were not possible during the earlier generations of video games. For narrative, this is very visible in facial expressions. We can tell so much through just the subtle changes on characters' faces. Yes, but new technology is just a tool, not an express ticket to good art. See AI. If we're getting more detail, it needs to be detail that enhances the direction of the story. What? Uh, we'll get back to this scene. Our special place. What could she mean? This whole town was our special place. You promised you'd take me there again someday. But you never did. I got a letter. The name on the envelope said Mary. Mary died of that damn disease three years ago. Is she really alive? The voice acting in the opening really took me by surprise at how good it was. I didn't think they could do it. Some of the pauses have been taken out, which may be for the trailer edit, but it's important that James does these kinds of pauses to emphasize his confusion. The voice acting does go a bit weird in that Hollywood safe style voice acting and away from an awkward real person who's mentally shook in that dreamlike Lynchian way, regardless of the intentionality. Excuse me, I... <gasps> Sorry, I, I, I no, was it's just... okay. I didn't mean to scare you. I'm kind of lost. Excuse me. <gasps> I'm sorry. I, I was just. It's okay. I didn't mean to scare you. I'm kind of lost. Blood now makes sound when it didn't in the original, nor does it in real life. <laughs> Silent bleeding has always been very eerie to me, and now it feels kind of tacky and Sam Raimi-ish. Even the stuffed bear, or James' finger, I guess, makes a weird squishy noise when he pricks his finger on the bent needle. I, I don't know. Even the ambient room track is constantly playing something. Now it's possible that this is just for the trailer, but it does feel like this will be the case throughout the game if the trailer is accurately depicting the final release. But what really bothers me is the same thing that bothered me with Resident Evil 7. Characters constantly talking. Now, where is that girl? Hey, wait! This 
place feels so empty. More than the other places we've been. Not anymore. And when she's in a different room, any noise I hear, I'll assume is her, not someone or something out in the dark. Akira Yamaoka once famously said, silence is also a sound. So where is it? Here we go. This is what I'm talking about. The town looks absolutely amazing and does actually capture the exact feel and architecture of the original game while in reinventing it a little. The town's locales seem to be completely unchanged. Even this bloody crawl space, which is completely new, is reminiscent of Silent Hill 1's bloody garage doors. I mean, look at this shot of the overlook from the top of the game. Every single element focuses on James, using the negative space of the lake before him for contrast, or else blocks and redirects the eyes towards him. It doesn't matter that he's small in the frame, he's still highlighted with better contrast and doesn't get lost in the more detailed elements of the forest surrounding Toluca. Even the tree lines point straight to him. This is brilliant stuff and direct improvement over the original hands down. I am wondering about how large the hospital looks. The original took more of an approach to make the hospital function like a believable diorama, kind of like the level design equivalent of forced perspective. Many doors had broken locks, and memes aside, this was a way to keep each open room important and filled with meaningful content without sacrificing the scale of the building. Now if this whole hospital is explorable, it's going to feel very empty. And not necessarily in the way of isolation, but in the way of not having things worth looking at. I hope I'm wrong on this one. I am very glad that the layout is completely different though. I wouldn't want to play a new version of the game with the dungeons being identical. Wouldn't make figuring them out again very fun. This is why I think they should just say it's a reimagining and not a faithful remake. Also I just noticed that room S6 seems to be missing a door on the map. Weird. Examining items in real time and having James rotate them in his hand is awesome. Very walking sim or something from a mist light. This is the kind of contemplative gameplay I want to see. Also, I know it's a common technique, but I love seeing Maria here looking at something of interest, silently, to attract the player's attention. Gives her something to do other than wait and helps the exploration element. Good stuff. Location cards do pop up when changing locations, even indoors, which I think is a bit unnecessary. We already have a map and we should know where we are. And if we don't, we have a map. I like having no in-game UI in Silent Hill. It was unlockable for absurd difficulties in Silent Hill 3 and often panned for Silent Hill 4, but this is what happens when you nix inventory menus. We have to put the information somewhere, so I guess it'll be over the screen while I'm playing. So the main thing that requires rethinking was the fog, because it was called classic in the original game, and with a veil that covers the world and, and uh, makes the player to feel even more isolated. I'm really concerned about this rethinking the fog quote. Due to the camera changes, looking forward is much more important and the fog may be too thin to be obscuring vision. Again, terror is about what you can't see in the fog. It looks fine so far, and they never really elaborate on this point, so I'm just kind of tentatively interested in what this means here. And speaking of the environment, we gotta talk about the other world. We first see it in this room where, oh, that, oh no, that's still the normal hospital, I think? Oh, there, there it is, and it's Alessa's other world. Or I guess the other world now? The new note found in the street also seems to confirm that yes, this is a multi-dimensional post-film Silent Hill, which makes sense. But this will really change the narrative as the other world used to be based on what James, Angela, and Eddie were manifesting. Not some hell place in an overlaying dimension with some spirit that actively punished people like in later canon. I don't know how it can be both an alternate overlaid dimension and also manifestations of James's mind of which he has subconscious control. James wants to be punished, which is why the red pyramid thing serves that role. This is also why Angela, who often is seen by players as justified in her circumstances, is also being punished. I deserved what happened. Now I did expect this, but for those who didn't know or misunderstood the classic canon, this is a retcon to fit the modern convention invented for the first film rather than the physical manifestation of delusions established in the very first game, and was consistent until Origins' introduction of the Mirror Worlds. It's just confusing because the common interpretation that Laura sees a different world than James is even more muddled here. She doesn't have a flashlight anymore, so perhaps she doesn't see the darkness but she's also drawing on the walls of a normal hospital and wandering freely. I, I don't know. 
I, I do appreciate the new detail of her passing through the doors just as Maria calls out to her, maintaining that Laura never sees Maria as opposed to being unable to see her for sure. Keeping the ambiguity here is a good thing. Atmosphere is probably the most subjective, and the trailer isn't really going to get me invested in the way that the game proper will. The tone of this game is very important, and the team at Bluebird were very keen to create an incredible atmosphere um, for, the, uh, for the gamers. I agree, and so far I'm not sure they've quite gotten it yet. The color palette, when not obscured with a bright red low health indicator, feels too bright or warm in some areas for a game that should feel gray and despairing. Not something Reshade can't fix, though. The introduction to the hospital has brilliant golden hour lighting pouring through the window, but this isn't totally appropriate for Silent Hill 2, which was defined by its desaturated tones. Grays, blues, dark greens. This looks more like Silent Hill 3, where the themes involved hatred and bloody violence. I understand that it was sunset in the original, but even there it was a dull orange before entering a blacked out building. This feels more like an adherence to realism over mood. They definitely nailed the dampness though, and the fog seems properly obstructive so far. One thing I'm not sure about is the falling leaves. I think they look great, but they also add a level of movement on the screen that might distract from the more subtle or corner of the eye movements, whether actually present or not. As it is, the leaves could be a visual white noise that gets in the way of being put on edge. They do look really good though, but it's just like this scripted bit with the wind blowing in. I'd rather stuff like this be incidentally caused by the player or the presence of some abstract threat, rather than an external force of nature that just happened to be tripped at the right time. If this happens too often, it will take away from that contemplative silence that's needed to build tension. Unless, of course, the scene has been recontextualized as being a reprieve from said tension, though I'm not sure if that'd make sense considering the active chase to find Laura. Speaking of which, jump scares. In just the trailer, we have quite a few. They were very sparse in the original, one even being a friendly gag. Several times throughout the transmission trailer, we hear more of those horror stings. These repeatedly clutter up the ambience. And this is what I mean by distinguishing between terror and horror. Jump scares don't have buildup, that's how they work. Scaring you when you're not able to prepare for it, they just are, and rely on their suddenness and unexpectedness. Silent Hill 2 and the series as a whole became famous for delivering terror, while not always delivering the release of horror to hold that tension for as long as possible. Going back to what Maria said about the hospital feeling empty, I'm curious as to why she says this. Isn't the town abandoned, or at least appears to be to them? Maria implies she's accompanied James further than just Rosewater to Brookhaven, which I think is interesting and implies new content between areas. But what made the other places feel less empty? What makes this place feel more empty? This looks like a classic case of telling and not showing by directly stating how we should feel rather than building an environment and mood that genuinely feels that way. Having someone who's friendly and wandering around with you with this beautiful, warm color palette has the opposite effect of tension, especially with Maria's softer demeanor. Even the tension between her and James seems gone. It goes against the grain of classic Maria who was malicious and manipulative, who invited herself and guilt-tripped James into taking her with him. There was a social gap between these characters which made them not talking to each other feel appropriate. Now they seem pretty friendly. I do like the shot where she grabs his hand like a wife would for a tease at her true nature. Good stuff. The characters as a whole now are pretty different. Not that they're so different to be unrecognizable, but their roles and motivations are changed. James is no longer a mostly expressionless man, dying or dead inside, suffering mental anguish, only awakened when he thinks he's closer to finding his wife. Now he appears much less confused and much more just here. However, both the original and remake do show him approaching people with some amount of care, which I appreciate. But I find it really odd how much less motivation he seems to have at finding Laura here. You didn't love Mary anyway! What? Hey! Wait! How do you know her name? You didn't love Mary anyway! Wait! How do you know Mary's name? When Laura gets away in the new scene in the hospital, he doesn't give chase. 
but just stands there waiting for the player to take control again. What do I say about Laura? She has become insufferable. Yeah, she was definitely a brat in the original, but in a childish way that wasn't actively hostile. She was sassy, but with a purpose, James often being depicted as the clueless one, not her. She also seems much older to me, maybe between 10 and 12, but with smaller proportions, which is weird. Maybe they did change her age, but then it doesn't seem age appropriate for her to be playing with teddy bears and drawing on the walls. She looks away wistfully when talking to James, which also isn't eight-year-old behavior and she keeps turning her back on someone she's apparently trying to run away from. In the original, James wants to talk to Laura to find out about Mary first and protect her second, if at all. He promises not to yell at her, then immediately breaks his promise, and doesn't apologize until his brain short circuits after he can't reconcile with what she just said. He doesn't listen to Laura when she has to get something until it serves him. James is depicted as being in the wrong here, and that's the point. Remake James, on the other hand, comes in calmly and asks, Laura, why do you keep running away from me? And how do you know about Mary? This is her safety first and info on Mary second, a shift in his priorities and motivation. His outburst is rather subdued. Stop lying! Laura, I, I'm sorry. I mean... Fine! Don't believe me! See if I care! Hey! You liar! Laura, I... Don't believe me. He immediately apologizes, putting his hands up. It looks like a bit of the scene was cut here for the trailer, so it might land differently in the final release. It also looks like Laura knows that he knows her name at this point, so we might be missing some new scenes and additional context. Laura then runs out upset that James doesn't believe her, rather than the original Laura who stands there defiantly, with no need for James to believe her. Now in the remake, the scene moves more organically to the hall, and James grabs her arm because he's worried for her safety, and starts acting more like a dad here, which I think is actually a great new direction to explore with James's character, since in some alternate timeline he may very well have been. Laura's lie here feels a lot more deliberate, planned, and malicious. Her eyes are unfocused as she does a melodramatic turnaround. This time, in the remake, James calms himself and relents to Laura's request before he even knows what it is. By the way, this is actually a great use of that close-up facial expression tech showing James' thought process. Look at how he kind of rolls his eyes and then that has that mouth movement where he puts his tongue in his cheek, which shows how he's intently thinking before replying. Really good stuff here and I love this bit of motion capture in James's face. But it's here where you can see Laura grinning at the camera and then the camera switches over to emphasize the very subtle door of doom. James then is the one to tell her to wait there. Again, reasonable, but it plays into Laura's hand a bit too easily. What if he had told her to come with him? What was she going to do? Original James was already suspicious. What are you doing, Laura? It's further back, in the desk. I'm wondering why she wasn't following him in. But he's not prioritizing protecting her in the original, just finding Mary. What are you doing? Ha <laughs> ha! Open the door, Laura. Why should I? I'm a liar, right? Want me to open it? Huh? Do ya? Oof. There is so much venom in Laura's voice here. Something akin to hatred or spite. Now this could work if Laura harbors ill will towards James as implied in Mary's letter from the original, but will necessitate some rewriting. And I'm interested to see what they do with that. Original Laura is also spiteful, but like in a teasing way. In the way that she doesn't think is that serious, with seemingly no intention of actually leaving James in there until he breaks his promise yet again. Open the door, Laura. Why should I? I'm a liar, right? Want me to open it? Huh? Huh? Do ya? What's the magic word? Okay, I guess it won't open it. I think I'll just leave you like this. You snotty little brat! Open up! Why? You... You... You <laughs> Remake James calls her a brat, but doesn't have the same force or anger behind it. Let me out of here, you little brat! Instead, he calmly changes his demeanor and even says, please. Please open the door. There's something in here. I think this close-up and the creepy grin from earlier are really what grate on me for Laura as a character in the remake. In this version, she is clearly the antagonist of the scene and intentionally leaves him there. Tripling the fart face line doesn't, doesn't help. 
If there's anything that tells me that the storytelling isn't going to be quite as good in the remake, it's this scene right here. Now for some stray thoughts here at the end, I love the original store names were maintained. Even Bar Neely's is still Bar Neely's instead of fixing it to be Neely's Bar. I respect that. Corpses looking like James is still in as an intentional decision. Love to see that. The blur effect on this nurse here looks amazing and is something we haven't really seen in game before, only in cutscenes and really only in Silent Hill 3. They also kept the green slime and the bent needle puzzle and the needle doesn't look like a corkscrew that's going to give James tetanus either. I really appreciate that. And look, save points are still in. Save points are a great decision to ratchet up tension between save rooms. Besides, nixing the red squares from the original Japanese box art kind of seems like it'd be a travesty, wouldn't it? Oh hey look, the ring puzzle, but why is it framed like it's gonna move? Or like it's nostalgia bait? Uh, one major difference I wanted to comment on was that James doesn't get the map from his car anymore. And I think this is probably going to be due to the retcon that Mary's body is definitely for sure in the backseat. Now this was always a possibility to speculate on, which may be necessary for the rebirth ending and possibly for In Water, but has some really gross implications in the Maria and especially the leave ending. Oh yeah, Laura, just scoot Mary's body over before buckling in. Or I can dump her out on the side of the road, either way. I'd rather they leave that to the interpretation of the player than solidifying it as something that's always true in all endings. And hey, there are multiple endings. The implication seems to be that it's more on how you handle combat, but I'm all about the subtle monitoring of player choices. I wonder how it'll work this time around. I really hope I don't get to find out till I play. All that aside, while the top level details look great, I still think there's a fundamental misunderstanding on why the original Silent Hill 2 worked so well. It does start to feel like the bad ending for players like me, where the classic Silent Hill narrative was a dream we all had, while slowly dying from the car accident called the film. The remake is not quiet, we can see far too much, it seems action oriented, the additions to the script are weaker, and the characterization is weird. However, the developers and the actors seem genuine, and their hearts seem to be in the right place. When playing these characters in this game, the thing that I paid most attention to was the original game. You promised you'd take me there again someday, but you never did. In general, I think the actors especially at least understand what the characters are about, even if the script necessarily doesn't. I believe they're honestly excited and happy with what they've built but I don't think they made Silent Hill 2. I think the biggest challenge that we've had was actually how to make the game approachable for the newcomers who have not played the original. Okay, it's probably a bit, okay, it's probably gonna be a bit controversial for me to say this, but hold on, hear me out. Should this game be approachable by a general mass market audience? Now, accessibility is important, yes, but only in a physical way, not intellectually. Fixed cameras and tank controls are as accessible as any other game design decision. They just require the player who's not familiar with them to adjust and learn how to use them. But I do understand why this was changed. Over the shoulder is familiar. Less learning is required, so less effort to start. But surrealistic metaphoric storytelling is deliberately inaccessible by design as the entire intellectual challenge is trying to access that meaning. I hope at least that aspect is maintained in some way. This is why horror as a genre has always been niche. And why, to break out of that niche and hit Resident Evil numbers, it needs to have an action focus of some kind. That includes stalker games where the running is your main form of engagement. Our goal from the very beginning was to maintain the game's atmosphere while modernizing the gameplay to make it competitive in 2024. Ah. So it's not about being faithful, is it? It's about running up against Resident Evil, as I suppose was Konami's intent from the very beginning, to capture the mass market. Instead, back in the day, they accidentally produced meaningful art, and it wasn't until the game aged so well due to its profundity that they were able to overhaul it into what they hoped to be a massive sales number AAA title that they've always been chasing. And it makes sense. I'm not mad, I'm just passionate. I don't hate this game. I mean, I can't even have a full valid opinion on it until I play it. This is just my opinion based on the pre-release info so far. I'm an artist and a storyteller and I'm sensitive to these things. If you're on the side that is in love with what Bloober has put together, really, I'm so happy you got the good ending. I'm just feeling a little in water, you know? 
My greatest fear isn't that they're ruining my beloved game that I'm so nostalgic for, but that this remake will effectively replace the original. Not just in canon, though that's been borked since Origins, but in the minds of pop culture and the public at large. That this will be seen as the better one, and the old one forgotten by all but us old fans. And if Konami never officially releases them, the old games will be relegated into a dusty piece of history that was buried so that a new game could be built on top of it. The original Silent Hill 2 is too good to be replaced. We can have both, but if Konami, and more importantly the fan base, would rather have this game at the expense of the old, then I am truly living in the bad ending, where the original series was just a dying dream. And now, this may be the third time I've had to witness the death of a series I love so dearly, only this time to thunderous applause. I desperately hope that I'm wrong.